Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Sigal Yoni Feller. I'm Director of Advisory Services at JFN, um, based out of our Israel office. And um, I'm very happy to host this session. We have about 45 people already on the call and people are joining. So I'm regretfully we can't see everyone and we can't sense everyone, but we see you on the call and in a few minutes I'll explain the logistics and technicalities of how we can create a more interactive session that you can participate in. We want to try to do that as much as possible in this uh, session. These are really challenging times, both globally and here in Israel. And over the past few weeks, I've been receiving numerous calls and emails from funders, both from Israel and outside of Israel, asking us what they could do to react to the coronavirus crisis, what they should be doing with their giving, what they can be doing with their um, organizations that they've been funding, what are the most emerging needs right now in Israel on the ground so they can react to them. And after it was more than one, two, five, ten phone calls, we realized we really should hold a broader session and take the opportunity to expand this and extend it so um, many of you can hear it and we can just um, refer to this as the beginning of a conversation that will for sure continue in the next weeks and probably months to come. So we're really just laying the baseline here for a discussion that we want to um, continue having over, the, over time. Um, there are emerging needs that are constantly surfacing. Um, it's really important to say that this is just the beginning of the situation. And in, in many aspects, we still don't know where we're heading and what the needs will be. But in many aspects, we are already starting to see um, things that we can discuss. And when we started planning this virtual conference, um, due to the regretful cancellation of the Palm Beach uh, conference uh, that was supposed to be taking place now, it was obvious to us that we wanted to dedicate at least one session to what's going on specifically in Israel and even more specifically with Israel's social sector in response to the coronavirus crisis and, um, and to what we can be doing about it as a philanthropic community. So we've reached out to two um, very strong partners of ours with strong hands and eyes and feet on the ground in Israel, um, which you can see both of them on the screen right now. We have Lior um, Finkel uh, Pearl from, uh, the, from Civic Leadership, um, organization, Manigut Zrachit, it's the umbrella organization of the civil organizations in Israel. Um, Lior is the CEO of the organization and will um, take the mic in just a few minutes and give you an overview. And Galit Sagi, um, the uh, um, director of strategy at uh, JDC Israel, um, who also comes uh, with years of experience with um, innovative philanthropy and strategies on the ground and reacting to ongoing and ever-changing realities. So we're very um, thankful to having both of you to join us today at this session. And the way this session is going to be built, in a few minutes, I'm gonna stop talking. We're gonna hand this over to Lior to give an overview on Israel's social sector, a few minutes in general about the sector, and more than that, zoom into the current situation in Israel today. Um, uh, in light of both the political um, very challenging reality we're all living in here and with ha which has a direct impact on Israel's social sector and more so, of course, now with the coronavirus uh, crisis. Um, and Lior will share um, results of a recent survey that they held in the past few days with Israel's social sector, um, really tapping into the needs of the organizations on the ground and seeing what they need and, and what they're feeling um, and to, to really try to cluster and aggregate needs and be able to voice these needs back out to us as a philanthropic community so we can calculate our steps. After that, we're going to open to Q&A. So on the bottom of your screen, you can see that you have um, both a chat button, but also a Q&A button and a wave button. And once we open the session to questions, we'll do that twice throughout the session, one after Lior's presentation and the other after Galit's presentation. Once we open that, we'd like you to use the wave button so we can unmute you. So you can really ask the question and we'll hear you. We won't be seeing you, but we will be hearing you and we can react to your questions. I know that we have limited amount of time. This session is supposed to go for an hour and 15 minutes. And I'm assuming we're gonna need or have surface more needs and more questions than we will have time to respond to. In that case, we'll share our emails with you and promise to continue to, to, to get answers to you after the session is over and then the coming days and share any resources that we can with you. 
Um, I'm hearing now that we already have 75 people on the call and the number is still growing. So we're really happy for all of you to have joining us right now. And we're welcoming all of you to this very important uh, conversation. Um, just a, a few general final remarks before I hand it over to uh, Lior. This is a new situation for all of us. I mean, crises in Israel we're very um, used to, but we've never quite been, um, at least in my lifetime, I've never quite been in a crisis that has been in such a global scope that we're all feeling these things together. We've been in a situation in the past, and JFN has played a role in this, when we had local Israeli crises and the broader philanthropic community wanted to respond to it and was using um, the knowledge on the ground here to try to coordinate and, and best react to the needs. In this case, now we're really all in this together. The crisis is happening all over the world at the same time, and we're all in learning and reacting mode and thinking mode at the same time. And I think the power of collaboration and the power of community and the ability to share what we're learning in real time as we move forward is very, very valuable for us to really be able to make strategic decisions and make the most leverage out of our funding and out of the energy that we all put into this to get ourselves and, and the global community out of this state of crisis and hopefully um, to land on the other end stronger and with, um, with the ability to move forward. Um, so before handing it over to Lior, I just want to put one thing in context regarding Israel's social sector. As you know, Israel is a young country and Israel's social sector is even more young than that. Um, most of these civil organizations in Israel were founded in the past 20 to 25 years, maybe 30 years. And in the past two or three decades, the Israel social sector took a big, big shift um, as a reaction to Israel's change from a social oriented government um, and a social oriented uh, country to privatizing much of its social services and much of, it, much of its uh, um, services are being done today through the civil society, through the nonprofit organizations in Israel, who are strong partners for um, the government to actually give service and offer help to very um, diverse groups of, uh, of uh, populations in need in Israel. And this type of dependency or outsourcing, and Lior will touch that in just a minute, just creates much more dependency on the one hand and complexity to really um, be able to react in a strong manner to this crisis when the entire government is going into a shaking mode, the entire social sector is reacting directly. And of course, there are other implications of the social sector with uncertainties that are driving out of the philanthropic communities, uncertainties, investment uh, losses that we're all seeing in the markets and mm -hmm. many other ripple effects that we're, um, that we're witnessing. So without elaborating any longer, I wanna hand this over to Lior. And reminding you again, after Lior finishes her presentation, she will share her screen in a minute with a PowerPoint presentation. We'll be opening up to Q&A, then moving on to Galit again and opening to Q&A. So please enjoy. Lior, your stage. Hello, everybody. I am very happy to be here to, with, uh, tonight, and uh, tonight in Israel, sorry, today, um, and uh, share with you our thoughts and our sights on the ground. Um, thank you so much for having me. My name is Lior and I am the CEO of Civic Leadership, the umbrella organization of the third or social sector in Israel. Please bear with me as I am not a native English speaker. Um, before I start, I want to thank over 70 founders and foundations that work in Israel who have signed the letter of support for Israel's civil society. This type of support means a lot and strengthens us, feels and, and makes us feel that we are not alone in these challenging times. Thank you so much for doing so. I would like to start with a few words about the Israeli third sector. So when we're talking about the third sector, we are referring to these organizations. The third sector of Israel employs approximately 14%, which means 500,000 people, and a, 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 and a similar number of volunteers. Um, it accounts for 6% of the GDP. In the past three years, almost 30 billion shekels of governmental funding was allocated to the third sector via outsourcing, support, and through buying services. So what is the current situation? 
First, it is important to remember and understand that the coronavirus crisis did not happen in normal times. We have been facing a lack of government, government in Israel over the past year. Three election cycles and still no elected government. One of the direct outcomes is the lack of national approved budget for 2020. And therefore, many budgets are still stuck in the government. Budgets, bud, budgets that hundreds and of nonprofits are relying on and waiting for. On the conference website, you can see a document we have created explaining the financial situation uh, um, the organizations in Israel are, are in due to the lack of the budget. Um, and that was all before the coronavirus. Critical budgeting decisions are being postponed as a result, threatening the sovereignty of many so social services and nonprofit organizations that rely heavily on governmental funds. On top of it all came the corona crisis. This crisis is having an immediate impact on the third sector in Israel. Civic leadership stepped up and formed the war room where organization can forward information and raise needs. Then we held a survey together with the prime minister's office and GuideStar Israel, which is the official website of the justice ministry uh, for all the information about NGOs in Israel. We spread the survey around all NGOs in, in Israel, and we are now starting to see the following needs. Only 7% of the organization mentions said that they don't feel the effect of the crisis, but almost 50% said they were significantly impaired by the crisis, and 20% said that they stopped, they completely stopped their, um, their work. Between 35 to 50% of the staff of all the organization were either fired or sent home. There is fear of losing leadership and the same for brain drain. Organizational knowledge that is being lost. Fear of their ability to survive and remain active in the day after. There is financial uncertainty and there is inability to serve the population itself. If because of quarantine, lack of transport, governmental health limitation, fear of risking the population and lack of equipment. The needs don't stop because there is a new situation on the ground and the government expects us to continue, but takes us for granted. We have, like Sigal said before, we have had crisis before in Israel, as you all know, like the second Lebanon, Lebanese war. And the part of the lesson learned from that war was the creation of a multi-sector forum. Now let's learn from past mistakes and use the mechanisms that were built as a result. We have called the prime minister's office, office which therefore held a round table discussion last week, opening streams of communication and cooperation. We are working closely with the JFN and the Forum of Foundations. We have issued a letter to the Prime Minister, which you can see as well on the conference website. The main points I want to convey tonight, today. The third sector is fully committed to fighting the Corona crisis because it is now the national mission. Needless to say, organizations are continuing to work on in the state of this emergency. Government ministries and various officials are already turning to the civil society organization to harness their expertise to address the unique needs in this emergency. Nevertheless, the Israeli government completely ignored the third sector in its ability, uh, uh, in its handling, I'm sorry, of the current crisis and addressing the needs of civil society organizations. I can't emphasize this enough. Organization feels that they are transparent. Civil society organizations are facing a collapse, which means when the government would want to implement its decisions on the ground, civil society organizations will no longer be able to do so. Over the years, the government has been careful to define its relationship with the third sector, not as a privatization, but rather as an outsourcing. This may seem semantic, but, it, but for the government, it is critical 
in terms of leaving the quality and the responsibility of the services remain on the government. Now we are determined, we are deter, de, de, demanding, sorry, we are de, demanding the government to take the same responsibilities and help prevent the total collapse of the social infrastructure that took us years to build. Three points I want to emphasize before we finish, before I finish. Things are happening very fast and we are doing our best to respond to an immediately ever-changing needs. We are, we are uh, continuing to gather information from the survey, put pressure on the government and applying PR efforts. This is a partnership between us, the third sector in Israel, and you, the founder community. And it is critically important that we, are be, that we will be coordinated and, and sensitive in these times to each other. And finally, if I may, I wish to reflect to you the state of the uncertainty that the organization face. On the one hand, there is already a feeling that budgets have been shifted from ongoing needs to the urgent support of organizations in the front line and, uh, and contracting efforts to fight this uh, current crisis. On the other hand, growing uncertainties regarding the future philanthropic support to the nonprofit sector in Israel in light of the global financial crisis and its potential implications on available funding. It was highly important for me to share this with you because as we said, it is a partnership. Thank you so much for this opportunity. We have um, almost 35,000 listed nonprofits. Lior did mention that on one of her slides. Um, in, in the ratio per capita, we're speaking of about 200 organizations per person per capita in Israel, which is an unprecedented amount of nonprofits. Not necessarily a good thing, by the way, but definitely a lot to coordinate. And Lior is, is working around the clock to try to coordinate and uh, bring out the essence of the needs and voice them out to the government to be able to be in the forefront of the, of the fight and make sure there is more energy and more awareness on behalf of the government and the general public to the need of this sector and its critical um, role that it's playing on, on an everyday basis as usual and especially today in days of crisis. So we'd like to open it to questions. Um, Shirley was the first, right? I think Shirley put her hand up, but Alex Greenbaum is is now ready. Okay, Alex. Um, so I'm in here in Israel, um, and we have a group of Jeff and sort of next gen people who are trying to do things. And what I'm what I'm hearing at the moment is that actually probably the Israeli government is this right is looking after the frontliners, the doctors, the nurses, whatever else. Our money is this right? Our money if possible, at the moment at least, should be going towards all of the amutot that, that don't have, uh, that are, their staff have been cut, etc. Is that where, is that the advice that you're giving, Leo? Um, can you clarify? Um, thank you, Alex. And first of all, I want to use this opportunity again to uh, please forgive me for my English. Again, I'm not a native speaker. Um, I, I, I think that the most important message that the philanthropic world can give right now to the Israeli government is the support for the NGOs that are right now in the front line as well. But because we feel transparent and because there is no real uh, addressing from the government to our state and our needs as organizations, but they do uh, continue to uh, tell us where do we need to go and what what are the needs on the uh, uh, to provide on the ground. Um, the most important thing is to say we support the organizations that are doing the most they can right now in order to uh, to fight the crisis. Uh, but we also think about the day after uh, because to rebuild the civil society in Israel will be much harder and will be much pricier than to to strengthen it strengthening it uh, today. So, so to your question, I think so. Alex, I also, want to, Alex I also want to respond in, in, in a few minutes. I'll also go into some general recommendations. 
I don't think there's a right or wrong way to go here. I think every funder will have their own passion and their own fields of interest and their own tactics or strategy to how they want to respond. Um, I don't know if you were on the previous sessions um, earlier today as part of the web conference, but um, Victoria from the Bill Gates, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation was giving a bit of a preview and you can see that recorded as well as to different philanthropic allocations on a global level and how much money is being devoted to different causes. Um, both immediate causes, medicine causes, weaker populations, and so on. And Edmund de Rothschild Foundation in Israel, as well, has also devoted almost $15 million to the medical community, to hospitals, as are others. Um, Arison Foundations and others that are already involved in the health sector are stepping up and, stepping up and also funding these, um, these causes through existing relationships they already have and additional ones they're adding. So I think there's, first of all, a big difference between if you're a big donor or a small donor and who you're already working with and what type of things you care about most. But what we really are, are hoping to emphasize here with Lior's presentation is to see that even beyond the immediate response to the needs, and many of them, as you mentioned, Alex, are parts of what the government should be taking care of, there are many more needs that are being neglected and are in a much more dire situation at the moment not only because of what's going on because of the coronavirus, but it's on top of this year and a half that we've had a lack of government and a lack of budget. And that put already the entire social sector in Israel at an at-risk situation, which is now even being more at risk than it, uh, than it was. So the starting point was very weak and it's becoming thinner and thinner. Thank you. I mean, I have a million questions, I, so I can't ask them now, but um, I'd love to have time <laughs> to discuss some of these things with you. Okay. Do we have any other questions? If anyone else would like to ask a question, you can, uh, you can wave or uh, use the Q&A and we'll, uh, we'll unmute you so you can join the conversation. Oh, Shauna Goodman has her hand raised if you want to. Okay, Shauna. I have a question for Lior. I'm, you know, uh, as, a, as a donor also living in Israel, um, I'm just curious about what your recommendation is. I mean, I hear you saying to continue to support your amutot that you're close to because rebuilding it will cost way more. And, and I really firmly believe that and, and trying to stay close to them during this time as moral support for them, you know, along with financial support is, is crucial. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just wondering, are you recommending, you know, that we come together? Is there something, you know, I, I'm a big believer of collaboration and, um, and really sharing our best resources together. Is there a recommendation you can, um, you know, advise us on of how we can best come together to um, you know, meet with the government and, and, and to partner with them in the most meaningful way? Um, I think, I think Sigal will speak about it uh, in a minute, but I think that um, if you're asking about co collaboration and things that we can do, to the, the philanthropic world and obviously the social sector in Israel can do together, uh, I think that the most current and pressing need is, uh, is, um, maybe a, a fund for quick aid, um, for um, establishing quick assistance for organizations in need and budgetary uh, problems. And I think that this is something that we are also talking about with the government. And if the ph philanthropic community will come and say, uh, we are also on board as a community, uh, I think that the, the government will have they, they will not be able to resist uh, matching or even more. And I think that this is such a strength that you have. Thank you. Shauna, I think we'll also get to that in a minute. Um, what we're sensing and have been sensing in the past few weeks that, that there are a lot of funders that are looking for other funders in the same fields to try to leverage their efforts and communicate better and, and try to figure it out together because there are no obvious answers. Um, that's on the one hand, and on the other hand, to really try to organize everything. So we're definitely the address, and I'll repeat this at the end of the session, any of you that are thinking of ways to work 
together in Israel that want to meet other funders or other funders around mutual fields of interest or or mutual responses to this crisis come to us and we will connect you to each other um, we will put you in touch we will tell you about other efforts that we know and since again this is a global crisis and some foundations that are probably listening to listening some foundations and funders that are listening now and based outside of Israel might be involved with similar efforts in the US or in Canada or in other countries We'd love to learn about what you're doing overseas as well, because um, we can all learn from each other and, and we're facing pretty similar things, although Israel's social sector has its unique characteristics. Um, do we have any other questions at this point? Can I say one more thing? Sure. Whoever, uh, whoever wants, uh, I am available for every, any question, any email, everything you need. And uh, any connections or collaborations, and uh, I will be happy to share with you afterwards uh, the list of demands that we sent to the Prime Minister's office. I, I just wanted it's Alex again. I wanted to say one other thing, if possible. There's a huge elephant in the room, um, and that is that we are going to do much more damage uh, by trying to by try, with all our efforts with trying to um, uh, stop the coronavirus than actually and actually cause i don't know much more i don't know social economic damage also probably you know loss of life potentially as well um as a result of all of this and i i i don't know if there's some way that some no one's touching on that at all like so i'd love to be able to hear people's thoughts on that too even if it sounds totally outlandish I think it's all too early to say about, you know, what every action has a reaction or it has ripple effects. I think the part of the guidelines here should be to try to, to operate as openly as we can and to think as large as we can and look at the broader picture um, before moving immediately forward, as often people do in emergency responses, um, to stop for a second, to look aside, to see who else is doing what, to see where the needs are the most. And, and I, with that, I'd like to share with you two quick slides, um, trying to kind of summarize um, a few points for philanthropic strategy. So I'm a bit challenged by the technicalities here. So um, a few general points of recommendation. One, uh, no, sorry. So a few recommendations that we'd like to leave you with, and, and after this, we'll move over to Galit to really be able to share what they're doing practically on the ground and take some of these general recommendations and give them some flesh and blood so you can see and hear firsthand from um, adjustments and uh, reactions that are really being made these days to, to try to change grant-making strategies. So generally, my recommendation would be to start with the organizations that are already close to you, your grantees, or organizations that you have existing relationships with them. It would be the easiest, of course, to work with. Um, it would be um, uh, you already have a trust relationship. They have needs. Um, and leaving them at a time like this to move to, the, to an urgent need will drain them even more. But while you turn to them and ask them what they need. And first of all, that will go a long way. We've already heard from many funders that are doing this. Their immediate circle is who they go turn to first. They have phone calls or emails with all of their grantees. What are they feeling? How are they doing? Did they need to let go staff? And with them explore how they're doing. First of all, just their feeling, and we've heard this, and I'm sure Lior has been hearing this as well from the nonprofit she works with, just feeling that there is a shared commitment that you have a back, that funders are interested in what they actually need. Um, as Lior said, the government often views the nonprofit sector, it's almost see-through. They, they take them for granted and they, they look at them as they're obviously over, always there. And when the funder turns to the organizations and asks how they're doing and what they're, what's going on and what he or she could be doing for them, goes a long way even psychologically for the organizations. Then if you dig deeper, to really try to see what they need, what adjustments maybe are needed to your existing projects with the grantees or with the grants. Assess together with them if you can make an adjustment, maybe you need to freeze or pause a specific project, maybe you need to close it all together, and maybe you need to allocate and, and uh, enable more flexibility to take that money to a different cause. Um, but be flexible when you turn to the organizations to think with them about this. 
Um, also in payments, maybe you can release more payments at the beginning or change the payment table, ease on the reporting and ease on the evaluation at the moment because everyone's in a turmoil trying to figure things out. And the normal guidelines that we usually work with in strategic philanthropy at the moment could be set aside a little bit. Try to be thought partners for your grantees. Out of the box thinking, and Galit will share some great examples in a minute, are very critical at this time. And organizations are really struggling and we're hearing this to realize or try to define what their role is in this new reality. If they usually do X and at this time they can't do any of it, what do they do? The sense of meaning, the sense of fulfillment and having an, an actual role to play in this crisis gives everyone the energy that they need, but also really takes existing personnel and manpower and very talented people and takes their energy into answering real needs. So often just having this dialogue and helping the organizations think it through and figure out what they could be doing differently, or sometimes they can't see above the surface level and you can take them 20 feet, 20,000 feet up to look on a broader level and challenge their thinking. And because sometimes you have a broader perspective because you speak with dozens of organizations and they're really just in their own and they're in survival mode again. And also on a tactical or more strategic level, some questions you might want to discuss amongst yourselves, your family members, your boards, your trustees. How do you want to react to this? You can start the dialogue now, but continue it, of course, in the coming weeks or months. Do you want to work in an emergency mode? Alex, like your questions, react immediately to the immediate crisis needs, or do you want to be more proactive and really turn to organizations and see what their need issue in RFP? Do you want to be more reactive? I already know many funders have been approached by their grantees. So do you want to stay in that place and just see who comes to you and what you can do for them? Are you looking to collaborate just like Shauna just spoke about? If you are, who do you want to collaborate with? Do you want to collaborate with other funders? JFN is absolutely the address for you. If you want to do so, we can put you in touch. Do you want to focus more on collaborations with national government, with local government? We can assist with that as can Lior as well. Um, and also, if you want to look on the organizational level, when you look at who, how you're doing, what you're doing in Israel, or do you want to zoom up and out a little bit and look at the entire field that you're funding through the organizations, and while you're looking at that field, try to figure out in that specific field, what are the needs at the moment because of the corona crisis? And if the needs have changed, what can you as a funder do, both through the organizations and outside of these organizations, or by encouraging the organizations to really be um, aware of these needs on the field level. And again, I think Galit will give you some great examples with the elderly community in just a second of things that they've been doing. And just finally, the final two points, if you want to consider, and these are some points that are relating to the issues Lior shared, do you want to invest longer term in strengthening the infrastructure of organizations in Israel on the civil society level, build capacity, help them maintain the manpower, help them stop that brain drain and invest in human capital because a lot of the fear on behalf of the organizations is that they're losing really good people. The fact that Lior mentioned a little while ago, between 40 to 50% of the staff has been let go. That is, un it's, it's unbelievable. And these are amazing, talented people that have been uh, trained, that are sources of knowledge. And if these organizations lose them and they can't recruit them again afterwards, this is a great loss to the civil society. So maybe you want to be a resource to the organizations to be able to maintain and pull through this challenging time. Or maybe you'd like to help raise the awareness to the third sector by the general public and the government and to be more involved in advocating to the government's responsibility towards the social sector, which are efforts that the civic leadership organization is extensively being involved with in these coming uh, weeks and months with PR efforts to really put this high on the governmental agenda, high on the public agenda, so everyone sees that it's not just the business sector or the health sector that are in a critical situation, the third sector is as well. And if we don't treat it now, we'll have critical um, issues uh, uh, along the way and not just now. So these are my two cents on the philanthropic sector and some things that you're doing. And again, I, I want to say our advisory services are open to you. Every member is entitled for two hours of free advisory services. You can all call me. We can set up phone calls, our team in Israel as well, to see what we can do to help you figure out within your portfolio what else you could be doing, put you in touch with other funders so you can make the most out of this thinking process and out of your philanthropic uh, funding 
to channel it to the most needed uh, areas at the moment that are, that are right for you and for your foundations. So taking it from the theoretic level to the practical level, I want to hand it over to Galit Sagi. Um, and I want uh, Galit to share a little bit about what JDC has been doing with immediate and very proactive responses that I think are great examples to what we can all be doing. And then we'll open it again to Q&A to all of you to be able to ask Galit or if you want to backtrack and also ask Lior. So um, hi, everyone. Um, uh... Good afternoon to those in the US, uh, good evening to those in Israel. It's been a long day, it's uh, 9 p.m. here. And the truth is it's been a very, very long week. Um, the changes have been happening at such a rapid pace, it's kind of hard to believe that just Thursday last, um, we were sitting in our offices, senior staff meeting, debating whether to cancel our two-day retreat scheduled for next week. Um, and where are we today? So it's really been, um, a, a roller coaster week, and, and what um, Sigal asked me to talk about, and I'm going to try and speak about for, for the next five, ten minutes, is kind of give a few examples of how we've been trying to implement some of the principles that she's been talking about earlier. Um, just a, a little bit of thinking, and happy to share with you. Um, so, I want to start by saying um, I don't know if all of you know. Um, JDC and who we are. Um, I can say that uh, in just one, one sentence, uh, we look at the vulnerable populations in Israel. Um, uh, we are an R&D, a social R&D. We develop new ideas, new programs, um, set them in motion, um, scale up and phase out. Um, in some most cases, it's for the vulnerable populations of Israel, the older adults, the people with disabilities, the chronically unemployed, um, children, youth, um, and families at risk. Um, and in some cases, it's also for civil society. And I'm very proud to say that we were one of the founders of civic leadership. And uh, I think Leora is doing a wonderful job and it's, it's a really great pleasure to see it. Um, so if we talk about the coronavirus and what we've been doing for this past week, so I wanna start saying that we were lucky. Um, we were lucky because uh, we moved to our temporary offices in November. Um, those of you who know JDC in Israel, we have a very um, beautiful offices or right in, uh, front in um, uh, Givat Ram in uh, near Hebrew University that have not been renovated in over 50 years. We decided to renovate them this year. We moved to our temporary offices in November and these temporary offices could only house um, less than half our employees at a time. And what this forced us to do, the move actually forced us to start working from home. So a few months ago, we already bought laptops for our employees, we trained them on working from, with Zoom, um, on managing from afar. We created materials, we learned from experience what works and what doesn't. And actually, when the decision was made last week to close the offices, we were ready. And within one day, we were able to move all our operations online and work digitally and become fully operational. And while we were lucky this time, I think that we need to kind of think about this and there's a lesson here that we need to prepare ahead. And I think if there's one thing that I really want to, to maybe add to Siga's list and, and something that we're thinking about all the time is that even as we're scrambling to adjust to this new reality, um, we need to keep one eye open and look at what's gonna happen the day after the corona. Um, and I will say a little bit more about this at the end. So what have we done this past week? Um, as Siga said, there is no manual. Um, we're learning as we're going along, but we started by doing the first things. And the first is learning to see what the needs are. Um, and I think that uh, Lior talked a lot about the needs of uh, civil society organizations. Um, we wanted to learn what is the needs of the vulnerable populations in Israel. What are going to be the needs of the older adults? What are going to be the needs of the people with disabilities, of children and youth and young adults at risk? What's going to happen? And so we talked to our partners in the government, of course. We talked to other NGOs. We're talking to our clients. Just two days from now, we're going to have a big virtual session with over 40 or 50 people with disabilities to find out what their needs are. We want to see what the needs are, what others are doing, what is being planned, and where can we be most helpful. Um, and I think that's critical. We only want to get involved where we have added value, and I'll give a few examples of that. Um, second, we mapped our existing programs to see what can continue during the crisis. 
Um, because we work with these vulnerable populations, we want to try and continue our programming where we can. Um, we've had to close some programs. Not everything could move to be online, but what could be, we did move. Um, and I just want to say that in some cases, this has turned out to be a great opportunity. Um, we've been trying to get municipalities to digitize their services for quite a long time. This is something that we've been working on with the government and it's been moving very, very slowly. And all of a sudden in one week, everybody wants to digitize their services and they're moving to it very, very quickly. Um, similarly, um, one of our programs that we never thought could be digital suddenly is um, workforce preparation for Haredim studying in alternative yeshivot. Um, we want to get uh, Haredi men studying in yeshivot to think about the workforce, to think about jobs, to become employed, um, and we've been able to work with them in the yeshivas, but it could never ever have thought that we could do it online. Um, in one week, we got permission from all the rabbis. We were able to get all our trainers, uh, all the train all the um, uh, Madrid, all the facilitators, um, get them laptops, get people working by their cell phones, and that entire program is online, something we never would have thought possible. So wherever possible, try and see if you can keep things working. But more importantly, also use these existing programs, as Siga has said, and adjust them to meet the emerging needs. Okay, so many of these existing programs and platforms can now be adapted and adjusted to meet the needs that are growing and emerging. So for example, um, programs that we had to help people with disabilities live independently in the community, their mentors are now offering support to all the people with disabilities, over 5,000 people with disabilities online, on, sorry, 500 people with disabilities online, on how to deal with the crisis and how to, um, how to change and adapt to the corona crisis. Um, we have a program to help uh, poor families. Families First, a wonderful program with the government and with the Rashi Foundation to help poor families get out of poverty. Um, 8,000 families in the program, they are now very much at risk of sliding into poverty. So what we've been able to do is get the government to adapt and adjust a pool of flexible funding so that they can now use to actually buy groceries and buy basic needs, something that they didn't have before so that they won't slide into poverty, even deeper into poverty in the crisis. Um, another example is that we have a program um, that works with Arab municipalities to try to help them access resources. We developed a new position. We put them in the Arab municipalities, the weakest Arab municipalities, so that they can actually utilize and effectively utilize government funds. This new position has now become an essential position considered by the government of Israel because they can help the Arab municipalities try and deal with the corona crisis. So we're looking at our programs and seeing where can we adapt the existing program to meet new needs? And finally, we are developing new responses, but we're developing, as I said, where we're needed. Um, and here I will give just two examples, but I think they're interesting because they really show how you find what your added value is. Um, the government recently launched just yesterday a huge effort um, to give out food to frail, disadvantaged, homebound elderly. We're talking about a total of total population of 350,000 people. Um, the government is going to be giving out food to about uh, 60,000. They're starting with 40,000. They want to get to 100,000 by the end of the week. Um, and this is a very, very big government response to try and help those homebound elderly. Um, so the government turned to us for help and we said, okay, what can be our role? It's not to give out food. That's not JDC's role. That I don't think it's philanthropy's role in that respect. The government has a responsibility to give out the food to the older adults and they're doing it. They're funding it. Um, they're diverting resources in order to provide those meals. Um, but those meals have to get to the older adults and for that you need volunteers. Now that could have been our role at a certain point, but actually today it doesn't need to be anymore because one of the programs that we have been able to scale up in a major way this past year is um, a big volunteerism, this volunteerism initiative that sat within JDC and we have actually now um, scaled it up. It's become the National Volunteer Council 
um, employees that were in the head of the National Volunteer Council, Ronit Bar, is actually was a JDC employee. They are now going to be running the whole operation of the volunteers, over 100,000 volunteers in different municipalities, delivering the food. And that is something that we are proud to say that we no longer have to do because there is a strong organization that can carry out and do that. So what's going to be our role? What we saw was we said, okay, the government's going to deliver food and the volunteers are going to bring it there. But what additional needs will those older adults have and who will see to those needs? So together with the Schusterman Foundation and hopefully others, we want to widen the net of assistance and provide additional critical services that the government will not fund. So it might be delivering medicines. It might be uh, giving them accesses to access to ATMs. It could be a call center to provide immediate information. It could be support services. That's the kind of thing that we want to set up. Um, Schusterman, we're starting with the Schusterman Foundation. We're very, very happy to launch this in 65 municipalities, hopefully tomorrow. And it's something that we would be happy to expand to other municipalities. Another example for the older adults. Um, one of the things that we see is how do you identify, especially now that people are in their homes and their families can't visit them, how can you tell if somebody is in danger of deteriorating? Um, so we were approached by a startup called Invisicare that they have a remote monitoring system that can use data from people's cell phones of homebound elderly who volunteer to be part of this program in order to detect aberrations in behavior that could indicate a deterioration in their physical or emotional well-being. Um, the amount of uh, phone calls they make, how long it takes them to answer the phone, um, who, uh, uh, whether they're going to the internet less or more, kind of using what they use on their cell phone to see whether they're in, um, whether we're, they might be deteriorating and whether we need to intervene. Um, we've tried this out on 100 people with great results, and now, together with the government, we want to expand it and pilot it with 3,000 people and see whether it could really be something that could identify problems before they get to be critical. So this is the kinds of examples of programs. They are just two examples. We could give more, but what we're trying, I think the message here is that you're trying to identify where your added value can be and how we can best help the most vulnerable populations in places where there other, are, aren't other organizations who could do so. Um, and the last point I wanna highlight was actually my first. Um, I think that philanthropy, in addition to providing the real needs of today, um, has an important role to play in looking ahead at the day after. Um, what's gonna happen after the crisis ends? Um, currently, if we're looking, uh, we have about, uh, I heard it's 580,000 Israelis are receiving unemployment benefits. Just last week, there were 80,000. That's 500,000 new unemployed, okay? And pessimistic estimates believe that number will double or maybe even more. So what are the implications of that? But what about the critical social services that Leo was talking about, that they might be closed for a few months and then what's going to happen and how do we restart them? And how will the government that already has a huge deficit um, be able to do everything needed to invest in restarting the economy? We don't have the questions to these answers. Um, we don't have the, the answer, sorry, we don't have the answers to most of these questions. But what we need to invest in today is also to look ahead. Um, so we're also alongside the programs to meet the basic needs of the older adults and the people with disabilities and the families at risk and to try and help and strengthen um, the civil society organization and digitized government. We are also alongside that looking ahead at how we can train the workforce, use this period of time to help train the workforce and get them to the point that when um, the doors are reopened, we will be able, they will be able to start working immediately. Um, how we can get them to fill in very needed jobs. What we can do to start filling in the hole um, when in the day after. So that's a little bit of what we've done to start thinking about all these needs. Um, just a few thoughts. And as I say, it's changing every day and we're learning every day. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Galit. Um, so we have a couple of questions. David, can you tell us who and unmute the speakers that wanted uh, to ask? David Fine and Mario Fleck from earlier. Um, and Mario had asked before on the Q&A that funders have important networks and should the priority be to help with protective equipment sources? Mario, I'm gonna unmute you if you wanna add on to that at all. That's my point, you know, I think that uh, this group here has a very unique and important network and I understand that uh, there is a basic uh, need going on with uh, more than 1,000 doctors in quarantine and several of the other couple thousand workers in health that I understand uh, are out of the, of the field in Israel and they miss a lot of the basic equipments like masks and ventilators. I'm sure that in the, in the network here, we would find uh, connections and suppliers that perhaps we could offer this as a, as a big help in, uh, in, in a very big emer emergency that I understand is going on there. So I suggest, thank you for that comment. I suggest that if any of you want to follow up on that thread and, and turn to us about that so we can put you in touch and help you figure out through who you should be um, leading these efforts here on the ground in Israel, let's follow up on this afterwards via email. My email is on the JFN website um, when you go into staff and you can be in touch with me and we'll follow this thread and see how we can help mobilize that forward. Okay, great. And also David Fine has his hand raised, so you're unmuted now. Could you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Hi, uh, thank you very much. This has been excellent. Um, I'm on this call as a funder, uh, but I also happen to run an organization uh, that trains rabbis called Barkai and uh, is based in Modine, but we're a national organization. A week ago, uh, we were turned to by the Modine municipality, by the deputy mayor, because Modine happens to be uh, divided into, uh, and the culture of Modin is, is it's divided into 13 different neighborhoods, all with its own uh, sort of uh, culture and different groups and things. And we happen to have uh, rabbis of ours that were trained by us and maintain a, a network with us in 10 of the communities. So the municipality knew that all of our, these rabbis had volunteer or, you know, in, volunteers in their synagogues that they could go to. To skip, make a whole long story short, we're basically together with the um, municipality now part of this uh, project that was just mentioned about distributing the food. Uh, we're basically um, running this whole network with the municipality. My question is as follows. Uh, I, and I think I'm, I'm not here to beg, uh, I, I we'll find the money somehow, but I'm just represent, I think I'm representative of a small organization in Israel. Uh, I, a week ago, I never thought that we were doing this. We would be doing this. Uh, we have one staff person. I, a week ago, I told her that she should be, be doing this and only this. Uh, and that's basically what she's been doing 24 seven. Um, we've had, uh, we've had um, enormous expenses, not enormous but for people on this call, but enormous for us. 30, 40, 50,000 shekel to buy vests for volunteers, masks for volunteers. Uh, the meals are coming from the national uh, Rivacha, the social services, but all the, all the things that go along have had to be paid with us. I'm, I'm afraid that we're not going to be able to, you know, stay in business. We're a shoestring organization. We have one employee. Uh, we're not able to do almost anything else besides this right now. So what kind of help could organizations like us, which there are many, 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 I've been talking to so many of my friends who are doing similar kinds of things and we feel we have nowhere to turn. What, what's the place that we could go to? I wanna, I wanna add to what you said and uh, in the first or second um, um, uh, graph in my PowerPoint presentation, I showed that uh, Israel third sector is comprised of uh, almost 50% organizations, uh, uh, less than 500,000 uh, shekels per year. So many of the, Isra the Israeli organizations are very small and they are dealing with the same problem as you. Uh, that is why we are now talking to the government uh, to release funds quickly because if 50% of, of social, uh, uh, social organizations in Israel will be shut down because of this crisis. 
we will be heading a much severe, a much more severe crisis, um, and the entire infra social infrastructure in Israel will be uh, collapsing. So, to your to your immediate question, um, they're all facing the same problem. So, I can't really tell you where to find the funding, but I can tell you that many of them are are fighting the same fight, and we are fighting the same fight for you. Thank you, Lior. Galit, there is a question for you. I'm reading out uh, um, from the Q&A. What is JDC's strategy regarding their other projects that are obviously harmed by the situation? And how are you balancing between the needs of those other, other projects and the new ones? Um, so, uh, so as I said, uh, the first thing we did is that we mapped all our programs to actually see what can continue to operate and what uh, can't continue to operate. Um, I'm surprised we were surprised to find that most of our existing programming um, we could operate at some level some needed to be adjusted but a lot of it uh, we found um, ways to take it digital to take it online whether it's uh, um, programs for people with disabilities programs for you families at risk um, yes educational programs with the schools are more difficult but many of the things we could still operate um, it's a challenge it's a very big challenge on how do you balance, um, I think, four different things at once. One is trying to continue your programs that we're already operating. Um, two is trying to uh, adjust and develop new needs to meet uh, the, the planning and meet the new and emerging needs and respond to the coronavirus, which is you know, very, very big. Um, third, we wanna look ahead at the day after and see what we can do. And fourth, we're in the midst of implementing a new strategic plan and we have these big new initiatives that we want to launch. So we're trying to find the balance of doing all four of those. Um, I'm sure we will not be able to do all of them at the same pace. Um, things will probably take longer. We also have to see what we might need to change in our strategy, what we might need to do differently as a result of the new and emerging reality that's going to be um, after the crisis. So I think that uh, it's definitely a way of finding a balance to do um, between the different parts. But right now for us, a priority, first of all, is really meeting the emerging needs today in the best way possible. Excellent. Lior, I think you're gonna wanna take this question. Joseph Friedman is asking, and by the way, we have 114 people on the line, just so you know. Um, I think it's growing like the number of coronavirus uh, illnesses in Israel every hour. Um, so Joseph is asking, has the government of Israel offered any assistance? And is the non-functioning Knesset delaying this assistance? Um, a very good question. So um, as, I, as I mentioned, we did uh, ask for the prime minister's um, roundtable to be to be addressing the situation and we met uh, last week and uh, there was, a, uh, we format um, a smaller community, sub-community, a uh, committee, sorry, sub-committee uh, of uh, five representatives of each side. And from last Thursday and today is Monday, we've been talking endlessly. So we gave them our uh, list of demands and some of them are already being processed. I'm not saying Yes, completely. We're happy. No, but I'm saying we do have partners uh, in the in the Ministry of Finance and in the uh, in the Prime Minister's uh, office, and um, but we still have a long way to go. Um, and I think that the most important thing is not just saying that we are working closely with uh, with with the this subcommittee and let go of the bigger picture. We need to do both at the same time. And, um, and we will keep you posted on new things that are happening. Um, two more questions. One, Alex Greenbaum asked about Khalat, the leave of absence. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, how, um, David, I, I can't see the entire question. Oh, here, here it is. Um, unemployment benefits, how long they last and percentage. I'm not sure if you want to go into that. But I we can, have I can some, send all the information afterwards. Exactly. We have all the information. Also, the network of volunteering that Galit mentioned earlier that was started within the JDC has a very, very active 
um, WhatsApp group and, uh, and internet presence with thousands of people. You know, Israel always had a very, very high rate level of volunteerism. Sometimes that's an obstacle for philanthropy because people who donate their time, um, it's an obstacle for them donating money, but there's a very, very high level of, of volunteerism and we see it now as well. Um, and connecting all of these people who want to volunteer with mechanisms of volunteering through the people of need. And they've um, really um, aggregated all of the up-to-date information about leave of absence, about employment rights, about um, getting social uh, welfare now, um, and unemployment um, um, stipends and so on. So Alex, whatever you want, you can turn to us later and we'll refer to anyone else, of course, if you'd like to get more information. Another question, uh, Lior, that I think you might want to answer and Galit, feel, to, feel free to jump in as well. Since we all know that private philanthropy will never be able to fill the gap being created by the corona, what is the strategy of philanthropy to advocate with government to protect the safety net going further? So either of you, you can feel free. Uh, Galit, do you want to start? Okay, I think that that you know we're what we're seeing here, at least from my point, is is the the different roles that philanthropy can play, and I think that philanthropy um, has an important role to play in a number of them. Um, I think that uh, definitely um, there are places where philanthropy can definitely help support. Um, advocacy organizations uh, um, like civic uh, leadership and other umbrella organizations and even actually turn to government partners and come and say this is important and, and, and this needs to be done and advocacy is one of the routes that philanthropy can take um, but there are other you know there are other roles that philanthropy can take that are also no less important and the other is complementing what the government does because the government um, yes it can uh, do a lot and it can fill in a lot of the void, but there's also a very important role for philanthropy to play in actually supporting services and funding services and especially those that complement what the government is doing. So I think philanthropy has a lot of different roles and very important roles to play in routine times and also different roles and that are critical for emergency times as well. Can I add one more thing? Of course. I think, <laughs> I think that um, it is important to understand that right now and through current events and the speed of current events, everything is changing so rapidly here. Um, and also the government and also the, the, the public at large, their, um, their, how do you say, Keshev? Um, attentiveness. Their, their att attentiveness is very, very low and they're focusing on things that they need immediately and that is it. And it's very, very hard to, to try to bring new things and, and, and make them interesting and make them listen, really listen to what we are saying and, uh, and make them actually uh, be engaged. And that is where I feel that the phil philanthropic community is coming so loudly and so importantly because this partnership if they don't listen to us, they will listen to you. And if we will be coordinated and we will have the same messages regarding what is happening right now to the third sector in Israel and vis-a-vis -vis the, 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 um, um, the, the people that are not receiving uh, whatever, they're not meeting their needs, I think that um, they will listen to you and then through you, they will come to us to, to hear what is our needs. And I think that this is such a loud voice for you to make. And Lior, if the emphasis is more on what's government's role in this and not the, not the funder, not philanthropy's role, do you have um, any idea? What is the government's role? I think, I think I was very, very clear before when I said, if you are talking, first of all, walk the talk. If you are saying, that the social services are still in, under your responsibility, then right now we need you to take responsibility over what is happening right now. We can't wait any longer. And it can be in two circles. It can be first to see what are the needs right now for organizations uh, uh, in the front line. And, and on the second level, talk about, um, about continuous uh, efforts uh, for, for this uh, structure not to collapse, the social structure not to collapse. But I feel that this is now the time to talk about it and we can't wait any longer. Because if we wait, 
there won't be anyone doing this work. And it's okay to, to feel and to think that we will keep um, volunteer forever. And maybe we will, because this, these, these things that we're doing are, are very important for us. And we can't just leave the people that we are working with, but, uh, but we can't rely on that. Okay. We have, I think, one final question here. Do you have a recommendation regarding what types of organizations we should be working with, smaller organizations in niche markets or larger organizations with pre-existing governmental relationships? That's the, that's the, that's the million dollar question. Uh, no pun intended. Um, I think that, uh, <laughs> I, I, I think that uh, as you said before, Sigal, it's, it's very, it's each, each, uh, each foundation and each founder uh, has its own cause and its own, go its own goals. And it's very hard for me to say one clear thing because to strengthen the small organizations, which as I said, are 50% of organizations in Israel, mean more of the periphery, mean more of, of, of organizations that needs to be strengthened. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, obviously the organizations that are working with the government are maybe are more able to scale up uh, quickly, but I think that they 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 complete each other and not uh, compete with each other. So it's very hard for me to answer this question with with a clear cut. Galit, do you also want to respond to that? Well, of course, they should give it all to uh, the big organizations with government. Really, no. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I would say I would say this. I think I completely agree with Lior, and I think the important thing is to really find your added value as a philanthropist and what you can do that really uh, brings in, you know, on one hand, what's important to you and on another hand, what's really, really needed that perhaps others are not doing and cannot do. So I think that, that that I think is what I would recommend. I couldn't agree more. So we have the last few minutes and I'd like to um, say a few um, closing remarks, but before that, I want to uh, let both of you, Lior and Galit, see if you have a closing say a sentence you'd like to leave the, the 108 people uh, that are listening with. Galit? So first of all, I think that it, it's amazing that 108 people are still here at 9.30 p.m. So I truly... <laughs> Israel truly time. Is all Israel, of them, time. <laughs> Israel time. All of them are I, Israel time. Um, I, tru I truly applaud all of you um, and thank all of you. Um, and thank all of you for, for caring um, and for, for listening. Um, and I know that each one of you is facing um, the coronavirus uh, in your own communities or where you are. And the fact that you're, you're, you're sitting here, you know, in front of this screen and listening to us and it's important is something that, that truly means a lot. Um, and so thank you very much. And um, second, I wanna say that because things are saying changing so rapidly. I know that now was the, the, con the JFN virtual convention, but I, but I think we're gonna need more dialogue. Um, I think that this is the beginning of a conversation and it's not the end of a conversation. And, and we're gonna have to continue and see where the needs are and what's happening in another two or three weeks. And, and I would be very happy to continue the conversation with whoever is still willing to be there. <laughs> Excellent. So don't don't hang up yet. Thank you both very much for your time and your preparation and in uh, kind of a last minute call. But everything we do these days seems to be last minute. Um, so a few final things I'd like to leave you with. Lior, you want to say something? Ten seconds. For, um, I, first of all, thank you and everything that Galit said. Ditto. Um, and I would like to add, please let your organizations know that we have this war room situation. We are answering questions. We are gathering information. We are trying to uh, help with the, with the immediate needs as well as the, the long run. So please let them know and, and, and please let, uh, tell them to, to come. <laughs> Great, we Thank will. Um, so for a, few, a few quick questions that people um, asked on the Q&A on the technical level. And David, you can help us here respond to that. We would be sharing the slides happily um, the survey that we Lior um, a little bit of, first of all, it's constantly growing in, in data because more organizations are answering the survey. At the moment, other than the slide that Lior translated, the entire survey is in Hebrew. So those of you who would like to see the survey and read Hebrew, we'd be happy to share. 
Um, Lior would be happy to share in civic leadership. We do not yet have the entire survey translated to English, but we might end up translating that as well. Um, so that's a second point. Our emails, um, we'd be happy to share all of our emails. David, let me know how we can do that so everyone can see them, maybe on the conference uh, um, description of the, on the website. Uh, I'll, I'll send it to everybody on the, on the, in the chat box right now. Okay, uh, a partner organization that I forgot to mention, but they've been with us through this entire process and are with us on a daily basis and are very important players and are on the call, of course, are the Forum of Foundations in Israel um, that are working on a daily basis. Lior and Talia Chorev, the director of the Forum of Foundations and myself have a, a small team meeting every morning to coordinate what's going on with the professional um, um, directors that run foundations in Israel, with the funder community and with the nonprofit leadership. Um, so we're constantly trying to coordinate better and have a flow of information. Um, Eli Buch, the chair of the Forum of Foundations, who runs the philanthropy at the Edmund de Rochelle Foundation. These are key players that are not on the screen at the moment, but are with us on the call and constantly with us in all of these efforts. Um, I want to mention the plenary that we have tomorrow called Personal Community and Public Resilience in Time of Crisis. If you can tune in and join tomorrow with uh, uh, Yoram Yovel, um, who's an amazing speaker. He's going to dial in. He's a psychiatrist, a brain researcher, and a, a psychoanalysis. If you've never heard him before, by all means, join us. And if you have heard him, you know why you should join us. Jude Yovel Rekanati, JFN member and the chair of the Gandhir Foundation, also the founder of Natal. And she's, she's going to be speaking about resilience as well and as Rabbi Chaim Steinmetz. So I really encourage you to join this um, call, if you can, tomorrow to join the session. Um, and um, anything else that we mentioned, and if you didn't get response, feel free to turn to us. And again, every debate you have, everything you want to consult with us, any thought partners you want to think out loud with us, or you want us to put you in touch with other funders that are thinking around the same issues, please use us. This is a community. It's as active as the members of it are. And I think that together we can make a very big and significant and impactful difference in these very challenges times. And, and we want to do it together, better together. So thank you all. Be well and stay well. And uh, Laila Tov.